<laughs> what up? What up, everybody? <laughs> Dom McDangelo of SCScoops.com and several other but whatever. It's one of a kind, and we're live with RBG. Hey, one of a kind, guys. Yes. yes. How's it going, everybody? Rob, how are you doing, man? Good, man. I'm feeling a little higher now. Hey, there we go, right? We're, yeah. we're talking with Seth in the chat here over here, the guy that uh, did your th- right. Did th- uh, I, I was it. like, why don't you get it on? You should get it on Spotify and uh, iTunes and stuff like that. But apparently, if you do that, then it copyrights it and then we can't use it. So, hey, uh, oh. thinking about that. Yeah, but yeah, I was starting to wonder about that too. Like, is this song too good for us to keep just for our own enjoyment? I know, right? <laughs> Maybe we'll have to do a reprise or a different kind of version, of it. Mm. an alternate version of some sort. But either way, we're live here, uh, episode 37, and we uh, have a good amount of folks in here already starting off, so good to have everybody here. Like I mentioned, BBDC, Jen the Dawn, Smiley Gardner, Greg Jacobson, there's plenty of the regulars here, some new people here, Uh, Corey, I believe, is new, and then John Davis, I don't think I've seen him before, but welcome everybody. If you guys want to ask a question, feel free to use the super chat, that helps support the podcast and get the episode cooking. And uh, be sure to like, comment. Uh, that helps the algorithm and get things going too here. Um, but yeah, uh, Rob, there's been some crazy stuff happening. Uh, by the time a lot of people will hear this episode, the Royal Rumble will have already gone down. But the big news uh, that broke today was uh, the allegations uh, of, against Vincent Mann. And a uh, big report going there from the Wall Street Journal. And then uh, pretty uh, from the allegations, it's pretty dark stuff. I uh, just want to get your thoughts real quick on that. Yeah. Um, well, I think it's crazy, <laughs> crazy shit that's coming out today. Uh, it's been a weird day, actually. I woke up to finding out about the uh, the death of uh, Jesse Jane, the uh, adult film actress. And, um, <clears throat> and then, you know, a lot of people uh, that we know are pretty bummed about that because they're um, – Good friends with her and so she's a really good person and then a friend of ours a girl that katie does content with um will see me max it was on tmz she passed away oh. as well do yeah you know, do you know what happened to her no i don't know they just found her um unresponsive is what i know but she's been with her husband for 17 years they've been together wow. here's a picture of us from the wow. content shoot there's me right there and there's musimi right there that was her clothing line of like latex outfits yeah. Would I shoot for her? Oh, jeez. Yeah. So they don't know what happened to her? I haven't heard yet. Okay. And yeah. Well, well it happened, but it's been a weird news day, though, yeah. for sure. Yeah. And, uh, um, yeah, someone sent me something, and then uh, and someone else, and then, you know, another one, another one, a few different people. I still probably haven't seen all the pieces, but uh, what I saw – um, was pretty shocking. I don't like. I can't imagine the Vince McMahon that I know speaking like that person that texted those messages. It seemed like it was coming from a depraved seventeen-year-old or something to me. So my first thought was, "Come on, like that's he really said like all that, all that." Um, and then you know, I know the belief is that they can prove it and that it's legitimate, credible uh, sources. Um, so it just leaves me a little bit, uh, bewildered, you know, like, I don't, I can't imagine that, you know, um, but you know, I, I don't know how it makes me wonder like these like billionaires that are like world leaders, what do they do for fun? You know I mean? Like you watch these, you see these movies where they like let people out in the, in the, in the woods and then like hunt them down and shoot it. Yeah. It's like a rich, rich, rich people's game and stuff. And and if any of this stuff, you know, is is uh, based on some truth, then um, I kind of make a comparison there, you know, as far as like someone that <clears throat> must have like such a hunger for power that they need to control someone. And, um, and that's about Vince, not, I can't say, Everyone else that was mentioned would surprise me quite as much. Okay. Yeah, no, Um, it was very 
just reading all I didn't read the whole doc. Uh, apparently, it's a 67 page document that yeah. they did. So there's a lot of information, but what the Wall Street Journal reported on was pretty, pretty allegedly heinous stuff. And so, uh, I guess we'll just have to wait and see. But I know that's what a lot of people is on a lot of people's minds. And um, it's curious, it's kind of a, a you know, way it's a you know, it's fortunate for WWE that like Triple H is kind of in charge now. And then you also have other news developing too with uh, The Rock, who we'll talk about in a second, and uh, stuff like that, where there's been a shift. And like a lot of this stuff is kind of like, okay, this is Vince stuff, but allegedly, but you know, uh, it's kind of like, okay, but there's a new ship in charge, and then all the news breaking with all the positive stuff regarding WWE. So it's going to be a pretty interesting news cycle, I'm sure, for the past, for the next couple of weeks, especially on the road to WrestleMania, in addition to all this. So. We'll see what happens, I suppose. But all right. Well, we do have a super chat. It is Greg Brennan. He just chimes in and says, "RVD is the man." I remember mm -hmm. calling him into this old radio show he had on his website. Yes, yeah, RVD Radio is ahead of its time. It really was, Rob. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. was always, great. always ahead of my time. Yep. But back on the Blog Talk Radio days, I remember. Yeah. Yeah. Those are <laughs> those are good times. I don't know. I have fun with it. Um, you know, see you. Have fun. See you guys. Bye. Yeah. Um, bye, bye, bye. that was, uh, yeah. So that's good to hear from someone that's been with us for that much time because, uh, that's an OG fan right there. OG, way OG. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, uh, Mr. Whisper chimes in again from last week. Uh, Katie just left, so sorry there, Mr. Rooster. But Rob and Katie, who out of the current culture of wrestlers do you see big things for in the future? Your personal faves to watch. Mm. I know well, Katie previously said before uh, Trinity or uh, Naomi from WWE, she likes her a lot. I know that, Mr. Whisper. But. Yeah, yeah, she does. Um, I don't know. I like watching uh, everybody, you know, um, Brian Cage. Pretty awesome. Um, uh, yeah, I kind of like to watch everyone and try to learn uh, who who all, who they are, learn about their character, or whatever. Um, but there's certain guys you like. I know when uh, like when Penta is in there and his brother, like I know they're going to be doing some uh, some pretty cool and amazing stuff. You know, so I uh, look for that. It's been, you know, look. For, I like to watch people, and I look for what you expect from them. I guess you know. I mean, Darby's known as the crash dummy now, right? So, so I mean, you know, it's kind of like next. I'll be looking for him to see kind of crazy bumps he takes and um, like that. Well, it's funny you mentioned him because uh, one of the news bits I had actually, and I'll just go to that right now, is. Uh, that uh, Darby on a radio show mentioned that Ric Flair talked to him about kind of what you were talking about uh, a couple weeks ago with Darby when it comes to like him being taking better care of himself in the ring. Here, let me pull up the quote though. Um, it's on the research here. All right. So, Ric Flair. So, this is what Darby said on the Rock 106.1. I don't know where it's located at. Uh, probably Georgia somewhere because that's where they were at. He says, Ric Flair, a couple weeks ago, he came up to me and is like, Darby. You need to slow down. And I'm like, what? Wait, what? You're crazier than Mick Foley, he said. I'm like getting advice from Ric Flair. And he said, what funny? what's funny is people don't know how great I feel physically. I feel amazing. Like nothing hurts. DDP, who I know Darby trains with also, he's like, we have to put you in a lab. They have to test you out and see what's going on because you're not human. He says, I feel amazing. I won't stop doing it. Sorry for anybody trying to give me advice. All the people out there telling me to slow down. I can't and I won't. So uh, he does some crazy stuff, like we mentioned. And um, well, Rob, when you can't blame, were... can't blame a guy for wanting to set new standards, you know. I mean, that's really what's all, what it's all about, and that's what's exciting to do when you're on TV, when you can do stuff that really shocks the people that have been watching wrestling for decades, and you still come up with stuff that they haven't seen that makes them say, "Oh my God!" You know, what did that guy just killed himself? So. You know, I, I, I get it. You know, we're all show offs. That's why we're in the entertainment business. And he's saying he's got a lot to show. Yeah. Well, I wanted to get your thoughts too, because back in like somebody was to tell you that when you uh, 
went to WWE or even in ECW, hey, you slow it down, you're taking too many risks and stuff like that. How would that RVD back then have what how would he react to you back then? They did. They all did. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So so JR told me, I said, you know, you're gonna see that uh you're gonna have to change your style a little bit and uh be a little more choosy about when you're taking those crazy flying bumps and diving out of the ring and all those uh, really physical moves that you do. And I said, no, nah, no, this is what I do. You know, I've, I've, and at the time I was saying, I mean, ECW runs like four days a week because we were not every week, but we did a lot of four day loops and three day loops in between at its peak. And so when I got to WWE, I thought, well, I'm ready for this still <laughs> the WWE schedule it, it just blows anything away that you could possibly do. So um, I learned that the uh, the through experience that, um, you know, I thought that I was on the road a lot and that I was uh, traveling a lot, but compared to WWE and wrestling a lot, but compared to WWE, it just became almost every day. It was, an, it was, an, it was odd when you, when, you, when I didn't have a work day and uh um, usually took that day to travel, uh, but I did keep my style though, and I brought that back up to JR at a Cauliflower Alley Club years later. Remember that when you told me I was gonna have to change my style, I wouldn't be able to keep up with my extreme style that I had set for myself by doing it every night on your schedule. And uh, he said, Yeah, he said, Yeah, remember when you said that? And he said, Yeah, well, he said, What you did was unprecedented, <laughs> so. Uh -huh. Damn, Rob. <laughs> Damn good work, Rob. Um, well, yeah. I guess the thing that could be in Darby's favor is that uh, wrestlers today don't wrestle as much as, like, you know. And, and, I mean, so it's almost like he's not necessarily being – I mean, he doesn't take as many as those crazy, crazy bumps like that a lot of you guys did week in and week out, you know, in comparison to, you know, what they're doing now. I just – the stuff he's doing is crazy. Don't get me wrong. And I'm, and he's like a skateboarder too. And some of that comes with its own share of bumps. So, I mean, but I mean, that's might be kind of the one thing coming in his play and, you know, hopefully it all, you know, he knows a lot of people know their body better than a lot of others do, but hopefully it just stays that way as time goes on, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, sir. So other mm. topics I wanted to get to was, uh, the other news that broke before all the, the Vince hubbub happened was uh, Raw, WWE Raw, going to Netflix uh, January 2025. Um, what do you think of that move there, Rob? Like, had it, Raw's been a linear television product for since its existence, and now it's going on a streaming platform where people will have to subscribe to see it. Well, um, that, it's it's interesting. Do you think that they they won't have any free shows on their other channels at the same time? Well, so SmackDown in twenty twenty four, they're on Fox right now, and then at the end of it, well, once it turns to twenty twenty five, they'll be on uh, USA Network. So okay. that, they'll be back on there. So people will still be able to watch SmackDown, but you have to have cable for it too. So. Uh, WWE has been fortunate to have Fox that everybody can basically watch if you have a television. So uh, they won't have that anymore. So um, and then uh, I can't remember where where NXT's go. Oh, NXT's going to the CW. So there'll be some some ability to watch it there too. But yeah, Raw's just strictly going to be on Netflix. So and it's interesting. Um, yeah, from what I understand, it's a big money move um, for them. And something you know that everyone should be really excited about. Um, I wonder if it will limit the amount of their audience. When when I did my return in 2013, they had uh, gotten rid of the pay per view buy system and gone to the WWE channel. So you had to subscribe to get the pay-per-views and then there was no more buy rate for the wrestlers. And I got to tell you, for me, <laughs> I mean, maybe, maybe they took care of everybody else that was there long-term and I was just there for a few months doing a short-term deal, but it, it affected my pay tremendously because when I used to be in WWE 2001 through 2006, 
the pay-per-views that we would do like once a month was a, uh, a really huge part of what we would make for the whole month. You know, sometimes it would beat um, what I made wrestling the other 20 to 25 matches that month. And so for that to just disappear, and um, I can't remember if it was zero, if it was zero or, or if he said everyone gets like a grand now, maybe. I, I can't I, remember either, Rob. I, I know I heard something about – I remember that being a big kind of topic uh, at the time when they switched over because they're like, yeah, wrestlers get paid via the pay-per-view buy rates and stuff like that. And, you know, they're taking that away once the pay-per-views are just airing for seven ninety nine a month on the network and stuff at that juncture. So, it was like, it was a big talk. I remember that. Yeah, I wonder if this will uh, affect – them and their accessibility the same way because uh i mean a lot of people have netflix but probably not everybody in uh i don't know i think people still that are older than me still uh, my mom or whatever she still wouldn't even know how to get netflix on her tv you know what i mean and um not that that's their target audience my mom but um i, I just think free is free and i think that you know that it's that probably reaches a lot more households than it does the pay service. So it would be interesting to see what that does and for, people, for the office and for the talent. Yeah. And people are creatures of habit too. So it's like you're used to tuning in and just switching the channel to, you know, hey, whatever channel USA is on for you. And there it so is. Yeah, at least they still get the same people watching uh, SmackDown if they if they tune in on X <laughs> right, yeah. yeah, and stay loyal to that channel. They the WWE hasn't lost anything, I guess. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see if they do any kind of. I, they're going to promote the heck out of it, obviously. Once they once that product moves over, but it'll be interesting to see what kind of crossover WWE will have, even more so once they're on the under the Netflix umbrella. You know, so uh, yeah, it's pretty free. It'll be interesting because I'm even looking, thinking about it. Like the NFL game, there was a playoff NFL game a couple weeks ago, and that was strictly on Peacock. It was not on a chip. You had to subscribe to Peacock to watch an NFL playoff game. And, like, NFL does huge numbers, obviously. But, like, this one got $28 million in comparison to another game that got, like, 49 million viewers. And so it was a significant drop-off. But what's the cost-loss-benefit uh, analysis when it comes to the long term of, you know, what right. streaming is going to do for people? Hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I actually um, – yeah, now that I think about it, I use someone else's uh, sign-in when I watch Netflix. So, so do I. <laughs> that's going to be something. You know, a lot of I think a lot of people probably do. Right. Because, so like, again, yeah, I share it with my brother, and that's how, I, that's how we watch it. People do that. So it'll reach a lot more households than they're getting compensated for, I guess. Mm -hmm. However they're getting compensated, I'm not really sure. Do you know? Yeah. No, well, I know. So I just know the deal is like, it's a ten-year deal. But Netflix, one of Netflix just pays them like a yeah. I think so. It'll be interesting though. Like, I, I'm wondering too if like they're gonna switch away from three hours and just go to two hours because they're not beholden to like, you know, television ads. So it's like, what what does that mean? Is it gonna be a tighter product when things come out? People don't have to watch for three hours if they don't want to. Maybe. Three hours too much for me personally. A lot for me too. I, what is your ultimate watch time for a wrestling show? If you, you know, if you're on, like, if you're watching it, yeah. What's the ultimate, the best time frame for a wrestling show to feel completed? You know what I mean? And not uh, overstay its welcome. Well, I mean, I'm gonna, I'm gonna fast forward probably through some matches, and and you know, I think. Um, I don't know. I won't for, I mean, for me, an hour is fine. You know what I mean? Like I'll probably pause it and watch the second half later or something. Uh, but it's, it just depends on, you know, that's for me. It's not, it's not uh, something that I um, get excited and look forward to doing like a lot of fans would, you know, like, like I do other shows, you know what I mean? Like I get excited about a uh, road rage Road Wars, Customer Wars, Court Cam, um, 
what's that new um, interrogation cam? That's the most intense out of all of them. But that stuff, I get excited. Oh, we got a new one, you know? And <laughs> yeah. Or they're watching it. And, what uh, is that on, Rob? Is that on Netflix or is that a, is that a? No, it's on like a. Um, it's either on ID or A and E. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, I think it's A and E, but I don't know. I'm intrigued by that. But that's the kind of, but I, I watch those uh, every week and um, and look forward to it. You know, it's a nonfiction, like real life, real reaction, real real drama, real people, and uh, and I like learning the law. But but so you know, with, with those, with anything, those shorter is better for me. Like when I'm gonna watch a show. Man, like 2020 has some great shows, but they went two hours out of my time, man. I can't give it to them, so I'm always going to pass that up. And then some of the other shows, uh, murder shows, where there's like uh, an hour, they'll split it into two different stories. You get a 30-minute, and then another 30-minute. And um, uh, ones like that, you know, I get... I'm I'm happy about, and I appreciate that they did that for me. You know, there's one that's 30 minutes, what the... Um, I'm trying to think of what it's called. They look at the uh, the cameras. See no evil. Well, that's one of them. That's not the one I meant. But they, it, it, you get to learn how police put the case together and solve crimes in a way that's really interesting. From having just a little piece of ev evidence to all of a sudden uh, looking at all the cameras that are outside, that are in stores or whatever, and see all the footage and put all the footage together, and then find them at the store paying for the murder weapons and everything and all the video uh, footage and stuff. I love, I love that. It's so interesting seeing how they can put everything together um, and, and end up solving cases. And, and it's like, uh, it's, it's educating in a fascinating way to me. And it reminds me that uh, we should all be aware. We're always on camera all day. Right. People are monitoring and, you know, and, I'm on camera uh, right now. We are. What? <laughs> Not only that, but Siri's listening to me. Alexa's listening to me. And I'm not sure uh, um, Furbo is probably listening to me. And I don't know uh, what they're doing with all that information. Uh, but every once in a while, they'll even they'll even chime in to a conversation and be like, oh, excuse me, I'm not sure I heard that. Could you repeat that? I'm like, I'm not talking to you. <laughs> I know Alexa's done that to me, too. <laughs> yeah. it, it's, it's, uh, dis it's disarming in a way. But I like it in a way. Mm -hmm. I like it in the way that it, it's helping us manifest the life around us that we want by programming things that are coming from our thoughts, you know, that they're shopping to us, which is good and bad, you know. I mean, I'm, when it comes to talking about business and stuff like that, I'd rather uh, not have, every, you know, have everything listening to me, uh, every last detail. But... It is like, like I've always, it's really just like I've always talked about how you manifest things in your life, you know, with the vibrations of your thoughts, sending that out into the universe. Now, it, with this technology, that's literally what we're doing in this secular world. It's like uh, the listening, and, and I, Sometimes I won't even be on online. I'll be talking to Katie or D about something, and then boom! As soon as I look on Instagram, it pops. The first thing it'll pop like right up, trying to That's sell me something because I was just talking about it. Yeah, mm -hmm. I don't know where the lines are. You know where where, where it's a little too much because we are we're manifesting. Our, it, it's the it, it, it's like not just the universal magic that's manifesting our thoughts into reality, but so are we with technology. It's crazy. It's nuts. And Rob, sometimes I don't know if you've had this experience too, but sometimes I don't think I even say stuff sometimes, but I'll like be thinking about it. Like, oh, I need to get some like Q-tips at the grocery store or something. And then all of a sudden I see Q-tips and I'm like, wait a second. Did I say that? Happen. Yeah, that to, to me, now that's happened a couple of times and I do feel like that's crossing the line. <laughs> right, if I'm thinking it, I'm not. Yeah, too I'm much. Too idea. personal. Yeah, uh-huh. It's very strange. Uh, Greg Jacobson, yes, this is a Shad Gaspard shirt that I have on it. Rob has the same one too, so. And Katie, yeah, Katie, Katie. commented on that. Uh, Top of the night, first thing yep. she saw. Yep. yep, pretty awesome, pretty awesome. Shad was awesome. Shad was the man. He was the man. Um, let's see. 
Very good dude. Rob, you're known for your five-star frog splash, but some people don't get the star ratings they actually want in the bedroom. So no better time to bring this up. Hey, this episode is brought to you by Blue Chew. Let's talk about sex. Guys, remember the days when you were always ready to go? Now you can increase your performance and get the extra confidence in bed. Listen up, bluechew.com. Blue Chew is a unique online service that delivers the same active ingredients as Viagra, Cialis, and Levitra, but in chewable tablets and at a fraction of the cost. You can take them anytime, day or night, so you can plan ahead or be ready whenever an opportunity arises. The process is simple. Sign up at BlueChew.com, consult with one of their licensed medical providers, and once you're approved, you'll receive prescription within days. The best part? It's all done online. So no visits to the doctor's office, no awkward conversations, and no waiting in line at the pharmacy. Blue Chew tablets are made in the USA and prepared and shipped direct to your door in a discreet package. Does it work? Don't you think you need it? Try it for free for a month and see. You're going to love it. Blue Chew wants to help you have better sex. Discover your options at BlueChew.com. Chew it and do it, baby. And we've got a special deal for our listeners. Try Blue Chew free. F-R-E-E. When you use our promo card, guess promo code, guess what it is? Guess what? It's R-V-D. That's right. Promo code R-V-D at checkout. You just pay $5 shipping. That's BlueChew.com. Promo code R-V-D to receive your first month free. Visit BlueChew.com for more details and important safety information. And we thank BlueChew for sponsoring the podcast. One of a kind, baby. Um... All right. Next topic also ties into the Netflix deal, or uh, sort of sort of roundabout way, I guess, because I think they announced it basically at the same time. But The Rock has become the TKO board of director on the board of directors. There. Um, what is TKO? TKO is what Endeavor was. So Endeavor bought WWE, and then once UFC and WWE merged. They formed an umbrella company over that called TKO Holdings. So, they, so is there still Endeavor or no? No more Endeavor. It's just uh, it's TKO Holdings. So once they merged, once uh, all those entities merged together, they became TKO Holdings. And uh, Ari Manuel is the guy that's in charge of all that. But uh, yeah, the Rock's on the board for it. Um, but uh, part of that also news uh, that a lot of wrestlers and talent found very significant was that um, he he got his rights, the trademark rights, to The Rock. I kind of forgot that he didn't have the rights to that, actually, and WWE owned the rights to it. So um, pretty, that's a that's a pretty good move, you know, <laughs> for The Rock. To, you know, um, yeah, that reminds me of uh, 100 years ago when the, the Rock first showed the world the talent that he had by appearing on a Saturday Night Live episode. A lot of you fans are going to remember this. He was just, he was a guest and he did so good. He was so entertaining. And uh, he did uh, the monkey character where he's like slapping his face and spitting and like food going everywhere. He was so committed uh, to every part that he did. And it was such a funny episode and it, it, it blew everybody away. And um, Siskel, Siskel and Ebert used to be. Uh, a big part of television, like when I was growing up, they, yeah, they were movie critics and they would watch movies and, you know, I give it two thumbs up. I give it one thumb up, one thumb down, whatever. That was the rating system, I guess. Yeah. Thumbs up or thumbs down. The one that was the, the heavier set one, I don't know if that's Siskel or Ebert. Roger. Was Ebert. Ebert Roger. was the heavier set one. Mm -hmm. So that guy, I remember him. I guess they were both talking about it, I believe. Now that I, think about it, I remember what he was saying, but I, I think Cisco was alive and it was it was their show. They were critiquing the Saturday Night Live episode that The Rock did, and, and they were just so blown away by his talent. And I remember the one thing um, that, that Roger Ebert said was that um, after seeing that, he was disappointed that there was already a movie called The Rock because Sean Connery did one. I think it was about a prison, maybe Alcatraz or something. Yep. Sounds like it would be about Alcatraz. And um, and he was saying that was the one thing he was disappointed. There was already a movie called The Rock because this guy deserved it. And then, you know, so he was, he was uh, penned to do or was already working on or we already knew 
for whatever reason, he was going to be doing the Scorpion King. And like, boom, he just like took off. But as far as uh, his name, The Rock, and him owning it, it makes me think of Ebert way back in the day saying, too bad there's already a movie called The Rock because this guy is the next big thing. And he, he sure wasn't off about that. No, he was not. He was not whatsoever. It was, uh, I know, here, I found the image, too. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there it is. It was so funny. It was, it so, was funny. so funny. That was, a, I remember distinctly exactly where I was when I, when that episode came on. And okay. it was like, they, they had, it was, I was in Myrtle Beach, and uh, I remember watching it, you know, just a 15-year-old or whatever I was. And, yeah, so... It, the SNL was great at that time too, mm-hmm. so it was such a big deal for a WWE guy, a wrestler, to be on that show, and I, it was, it felt like very appropriate for the time period. The Rock and Roll, yeah, so great. So great. Yeah, yeah, that was that was really awesome, and I think they also predicted he wouldn't be wrestling uh, much longer. And yeah, for the full time, it wasn't that much longer. He was he was out of there. No. So that's really cool, though, that, um, that he's on board for this big company. Like, that's that's amazing. You know, like, uh, it's, it's hard to imagine looking up to the status and position that The Rock is in and imagine how do you move up from there? You know, like, besides running for president, <laughs> how do, how, where else do you go? And then when something like this, like, I don't know, is he, you say he's a CEO or he's a chairman or he's just or, on the board of directors. Right. Okay. Okay. Yep. Uh, mm-hmm. That's awesome though. And um, doesn't he have a football team? Yeah. So he, the XFL merged with the, um, whatever the USFL, they just merged. So they're going to be a whole entity too. I don't know if he still owns part of that or not. If somebody in the chat oh. knows that, let me know. But I and, and it wasn't a team; it was the whole organization. He owned the whole league, yeah. so pretty crazy. Yeah. Aside from running for president, I don't know what more the Rock can do to get like a bigger status. That's basically you, it. You, you know, pin the Rock. That <laughs> That's awesome. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Very impressive, though, and I mean, and he's yeah, he's someone we can all look up to. He's. His charm comes out in everything he does. So if someone doesn't like them, there's something wrong with them. Right. I, yeah. Something that's pretty cool too, Rob, and I was talking about this on with Gagne and Magnum earlier, was that, um, you know, it's cool that Triple H is kind of running everything and he's such a student of the business and stuff like that and has a pres- train with Killer Kowalski and had an appreciation for the NWA. And so he's like has this tie to the history of wrestling and how wrestling should be portrayed. And then it's almost like Rock is a – a fail safe in a certain way where he's on the board of directors and he's got all the wrestling knowledge and love for wrestling too, where it's like, you know, it's not like Disney bought WWE and they fired everybody and Hey, we're going to get a whole bunch of producers and whoever get Hollywood people to come in and do wrestling instead. And so it's like kind of cool that this, we still got those guys in there that's still in charge and operate things. So. Yeah. Yeah. It's really interesting because for a few years, I've been asked, where do I see wrestling going? Because it's it's definitely changed just in the last several years. What it is has changed. Uh, I think a lot of fans have, have noticed that by the younger guys compared to the Attitude Era, for instance. And if it keeps moving in that direction, I was trying to figure, like, I, I could have seen it going – to where it's more like a um, like a traveling Broadway play kind of thing, mm-hmm. you know, like which I don't think would be good. But I mean, I was just trying to look at the direction and, and where I saw a lot of changes. Um, but there's so much happening that I wouldn't have ever imagined by the whole playing field changing over and over again and uh it's just cool because uh, you know wrestling isn't about what it used to be about you know obviously like it started way back in the day being about one thing and it was a real private um secret society that didn't have to adhere to outside rules of society of the world uh you know and 
just seeing where it's at now, and a lot of times I say it in a complaining, in a, maybe not complaining, but I, I don't know, I point out now it's uh, corporate, work-friendly, um, politically correct, you know, kind of working environment where uh, it's, it's it, so it's not about that, that, that magic that it used to be about, everybody worked very hard to protect that magic because they made a living off of it. And now um, it, it's not about th that magic at all. And so it, it's interesting to s just to imagine like how if it does change into something else, like what is it gonna be? And, and, and by its um, roots being ripped right out of the ground and moving and being replanted, it seems like that's, that's a, a definite, possible um point of of a uh, of another direction taking place and who knows what but <clears throat> being uh one of the only guys from my generation that s still moves you know s still rests and i still i still feel good and still do my moves and um there's not many of my peers that that do that, especially like RVD, because nobody does it like RVD, one of a kind. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, uh, being in that position, having the knowledge and and experience that I do, and still having the physical abilities that I do, I feel like I'm in a really good place, even though. Um, my place in the long run might not be about wrestling at all. Um, as far as in the wrestling world or wrestling universe, if wrestling uh, is going to grow into something else, I just know I'm in a good position. Even if trips isn't calling me, uh, asking me to, <clears throat> to, um, you know, to be there every Monday night or, or whatever. Either way, it's like I, I feel like I'm just I'm in a great position uh, that only good things can come from, and uh, and and it does. You know that's why I'm still wrestling. That's why I do all the autograph signings and, and and meet with all the fans. Like I love that. So hopefully I'll always do that. And of course I I, I see my value and express my value there, but. Um, as far as the world of wrestling possibly becoming something different and stuff, um, there's going to be a need for my one of a kind perspective somewhere. 100%. You know, it's kind of funny you mentioned that too, Rob, because part of the what I was also going to talk about was um, an aspect that kind of did uh, hit a little bit of the news cycle too. And that was. Um, that WWE is reportedly going to focus a little bit more on the realistic sports element side of wrestling moving forward, too. Let's see if I can find where I got that information. From. Oh, it's up here. Yeah, here we go. So I think this is from PW Insider. It says, we are told that the talk at Raw yesterday and at WWE headquarters today is that the company will be incorporating some sports-centric elements into the programming. Now, I'm not too clear on this. Maybe some of the chat can help me out with this. But it says, Cody Rhodes being interviewed on Raw earlier today complete with the clock listing the time was an example of given trying to root the product into stronger realism we are told that interviews will reflect this as well and then on top of it too aew i know is bringing back their ranking system which is definitely has a sports like kind of feel to it too where it's like hey this person is more eligible to fight samoa joe for the title than this person is. who's so, doing that uh, aew is they're bringing a ranking system back they initially started with it uh, but they didn't stick with it very long. They usually had the top five people in contention for uh, the titles, so um, they're gonna they're gonna bring that back and make more of that a focus. So, um, so like hopefully that might be an indication that the scales are balancing out. Where it's like, yeah, you have those fast pace and people are really focused on the moves right now and the athleticism of the talent, but like uh, getting that legitimacy legitimacy back in incorporated to it and kind of making it feel more like that sports product that it conveys, I think is pretty important. So maybe we'll see some, some good stuff. Moving is that, forward. is that like what they're saying though? Cause I'm not really sure from what you said, 
if that's what can you can you read that again yeah yeah let me pull it up here so this is regarding WWE WWE I think Um, I heard heard, I translated differently in my head but I was okay so so so, okay so this is like I said I think this is from PW Insider and it says we are told that the talk at Raw yesterday so this report must came out on Tuesday and at WWE headquarters today is that the company will be incorporating some sports centric elements into the programming Cody Rhodes being interviewed on Raw earlier today, complete with the clock listing the time, was an example of giving, of given trying to the root the product in a stronger realism. We're told that this will reflect in interviews as well. So, um, so it kind of sounds cool. interesting. What, what explain the clock to me? So I think what they meant, and let me see if anybody said anything. I think what it was is maybe Cody Rhodes had a previous interview earlier in the day. Uh, that they showed, and then they must have showed like the clock time of where in this interview was going on. So it was an indication, like, hey, this happened earlier in the day instead of them just saying it earlier in the day. Maybe that's what I'm gathering from it. I was kind of confused at that though too. But uh, the sports centric term is what kind of stuck out to me in regards to hey, they're trying to focus a little bit more on you know getting the product across from a more sports like feel, and that kind of makes sense though too because I mean. TKO Holdings is like, you know, very sports oriented and focused. So hopefully that is a positive thing for TKO or TKO. Yeah. TKO. What's it stand for? I don't think it stands for anything. <laughs> yes, <it's> a, doesn't <laughs> it? Yes. I don't think it does. I think it's just like. Tony Khan owns. Tom kicks opiates. Hey, uh, I'm I'm trying to scroll through here too um, on the chats, and um, Seth from Venice Beach Dub Club finished and loved the Celestine prophecy. So that's fucking oh. awesome. Good to know. Good to know. I, you know, if you if you love it, like I know you loved it, your life has changed, uh, and you'll see you'll see everything different now. It changes changes your perspective. But I want to get back to. Um, what were we talking about before uh, the yeah, realism? You know. Yeah, so sports centric. What the fuck does that mean? Because like I'm thinking, I remember not that that long ago. Well, maybe God damn, the years. It's hard yeah. for me to judge time. That's one thing uh, <laughs> that when I sometimes I, I I'll I'll be like uh, talking about something that I think happened last week. And then I'm like, was that six months ago? <laughs> it's so hard to play. They all put together sometimes. After, especially after a week or two after that. Um, but I, I just remember it was probably maybe two years ago now. A some promoting that I saw, and I maybe it was for NXT, and it seemed like they were using a word. Maybe it was inclusive, maybe, and trying to make every like. Like that was their goal. Like it was going to be everything was going to be like uh, inclusive, and, th- and that was going to be like what they were aiming for, which to me meant making everybody feel like they're part of it. And they were showing what they wanted for tomorrow's stars. I don't know if these were signed talent or what, but I remember seeing things that I thought were so weird. And this is what I would have thought would have been sports centric. They were incorporating, like, I don't know, a rollerblader, uh, a kid that was a skateboarder, a kid that was playing basketball or something like that. Very ordinary, regular-looking, very young adults or old teenagers that were doing different sports. And whatever this promo was, they were going to be recruiting these kids and other kids like them. You know what I'm talking about? Yes. I think you're referring to the the NIL program that they have, the Next in Line, it's called. And so they go and recruit collegiate athletes. Oh, okay. um, They try to sign them to deals, like a one-year deal or or something like an NXT or performance center deal. So it's like – and they did. So what you were probably thinking is like they had like volleyball players uh, from college, uh, gymnasts, uh, wrestlers, uh, football players, basketball players. I didn't get it. I didn't. I mean, I guess I misunderstood it. I thought they were saying these. This is what you know. This is what who we want on our TV show. Not the old wrestler looking wrestlers, but these kids. That's what I thought. Oh no! So I, I think they're they're collegiate athletes. So they're g- giving uh, some of these 
uh, talents that uh, might not necessarily make it like in a bit on a bigger stage. You know, if you're a volleyball, a collegiate volleyball, a premier collegiate volleyball, the only thing that you could maybe do is the Olympics outside of that. If you're, I, if you're a volleyball, you might get cast aside uh, Tom Hanks. In a yes, movie. exactly. So that's, you know, that's good acting on, career is a volleyball still. Right. Wilson was, I don't know. I don't know how I didn't walk away with the Academy. Then. But um, yeah, so <laughs> that's um, so that's kind of what I think, and th there's they're very still into that because um, they signed that uh, guy that uh, what's the guy's name that he was a gold medalist wrestler. Kurt Angle. Yeah, that's him. That's him. Uh, <laughs> Gabe Gabe Gable Stevenson Stevenson. That's who it was. So they signed him, and um, yeah, there's a couple other. There's twins. I was thinking. So I was thinking with the sports centric that they were just gonna be. Uh, that's how I took it, like not knowing what it was, not knowing what they're talking about wanting to do. I was just imagining them trying to incorporate all this crazy stuff that was floating around in my head from that from that promo. But uh, but it sounds cool, though, if you're you know, if you're talking about uh, capitalizing on the realism of of what it is, because there's so many ways you could do that. And for me. Being a 30 some year vet of the ring, I always roll my eyes when somebody defends the realness of the business with an injury. You know, yeah. oh, you, you, you want to call it fake? Then how come I got a big gash on my forearm? How come I got this many stitches? Because you fucked up, right? <laughs> what does that have to do with anything? You know, except for the point that they're coming from where um, the dangers are real or the risks or whatever. But for me, it's never been about that. It's been about the competition. I mean, that means you fucked up that. You know what? You could be a backup dancer in for Beyonce and slip back there on the wire and cut your fucking forearm and it doesn't mean that, that, that that's real either. If it's choreographed dancing, it's choreographed. But, yeah, the dangers are real. Yeah, you're dancing and you could slip. Same exact thing there, right? Mm -hmm. but, but for me, it's always been about the competition because ever since I got into the business, before I got into the business, I wanted to be the best, you know? And, uh, and I got taught by the Sheik and Sabu to always try to outshine everyone, try my best to have the best match on the card so the fans will remember me so that I'll stand out. They'll go home, hopefully, you know, they try to make it so the fans go home talking about me, even if I was second match, you know, and, and, and there was 10 year veterans that were in the main event that nobody gave a shit about, you know, and, I, and so I always had that mindset. I always wanted to Im impress the crowd the most. And when, when, when I'm out there wrestling, it's that uh, that competitive spirit that 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 that, that comes out and, and is on display, and, um, and and the way that it used to be, you know, sometimes, especially like in Japan, sometimes the level of competition was so high um, that we would literally be trying to not sell as much of the other guy's stuff for instance sabu and i had a tag match one time with um akiyama and uh amori i believe in and and before them and it was the winner of that was going to be uh uh contenders for the tag team titles and we wanted those belts but guess what those guys wanted the belts too not, not on the script for real we, we both wanted to be champion. We both thought that should be us. We wanted that position. It was good business. And so before the match, and this is when I still listened to everything Sabu said. I mean, he, he's always my mentor, but this was like, this was probably 97, 98, somewhere around there. I don't know, but he said, uh, maybe 96, but he, he said to me before the match, he said, hey, um, you know, uh, don't, don't, don't sell their stuff that much, you know, like, like what, whatever they're giving us, you know, try to, try to keep the upper hand and uh, try to keep them in our corner. That way we can uh, smother them, take advantage of them. And uh, let's try and keep doing quick tags so that we can be fresh and, uh, and try to keep them in our corner and blow them up. In other words, 
make them winded and stay on top of them. And, and Sabu said, hey, anytime you see one of them covering me to try to pin me, boom, come in and make the save. Every time, come in and kick him in the head. And this is not what we were telling them. This is what we were telling each other because we were competing to that level. And I guarantee you that Akiyama and Amori were in the other room uh, doing the exact same thing. And, and it showed in the match. You know, they they did want that position and wanted to uh, smother us and be, become the tag team champions. And that's the, that's the sh stuff that makes it competitive. That's the stuff that, that makes it real. You think that you think the, the guy in the ring doesn't want to impress the crowd the most, impress the promoter the most. You think everyone doesn't want to win the match. You think everyone doesn't want to be the champion, get be in the main event, get paid the most out of everybody else. That's where it's competitive. And I don't give a fuck if you messed up and sliced your forearm. All that told me is that you fucked up. Right. No, it's like, yeah, the, and that's what people want. Like, Wrestling is a simulated sport where it's like, hey, the people want to win and the titles want to mean something. And like to you guys, the titles meant that, hey, that's you're the best of the workers that, have, you know, that have achieved that and want to, to get to that point. Um, I would so imagine if they're going to be capitalizing on the realism, they show RVD doing his uh, stretching before a match, you know, warming up, throwing kicks. <sighs> trying to get my energy up at the peak of the entire day. Like, boom, out there wrestling. That is the most intense part of the whole day. Uh, and, you know, besides working out, it's it's definitely, a, um, you know, a, a competitor for the top energy ex expulsion. And uh, just there's a lot, you know, you got to, bam, I got to give it my all. Let's let's go. You got to be committed and boom, let's, let's be ready. And, and sometimes I'll just – I'll be like, man, if I'm just not warmed up enough, you know, that could go against me. Or if I if I forgot to stretch my hamstrings, uh oh, you know, what if I pull a hamstring? I forgot, you know, all that goes through my head. So I'm, I'm like, you know, like um, uh, I don't want to use the word uh, nervously, but I'm seriously preparing. Uh, to go out there and that's the kind of stuff that's real you know the guys that are doing the push-ups and running down the hallways or, or or whatever it is because they're athletes and they're going out there uh wanting to look like athletes right right it's like and you know fans want to see that behind the scenes stuff where it's like hey this is what they do to prepare and get ready and all that and it's a it's a they, there's a lot that they could do to kind of convey that you know to get that across on on television um when it comes to like a something like that, so like was Baba in charge back then? Ninety seven, ninety six, New Japan. Yeah, I started uh, for All Japan in ninety three, mm -hmm. and all the way to all the way to ninety nine when Giant Baba died. He was my boss. Okay, so what I was gonna ask, so if Baba were to see something like that, like hey, you guys are kind of blowing them up or smothering them in the ring, and you guys communicated like. Would he be like, uh, hey, that's not what you're supposed to do? Or would it be like, well, why didn't this team battle back and do their own kind of thing? Does that make sense? Like, Yeah, yeah, I get your question. And I, I would imagine it would be the, the later, you know. Um, yeah. I, believe, I think that he would grab his guys and say, you know, if we were able to keep the upper hand, for instance, I think his guys would be – punished and he would be like how, you know how'd you let them how'd you let them make you look like that man they they ate you know they mopped the floor with you guys what would you do but in his own words and, and i believe that would be his perspective on that if if that was to happen but instead you know everybody is so competitive they're just made for like a really good match right you know, right. we weren't gonna we were trying to keep them in our corner but they were trying to keep us in their corner <laughs> you know? yeah yeah well what happened what ultimately happened with that rob Oh, those guys got the tag belts. Yeah. Yeah. You wanted to you drew a line in the sand though. At least you guys established yourself. So pretty cool. I think his name was Amori. Um yeah, it was Akiyama and, uh, and Amori. Um but anyway, uh yeah, the only other belt I remember going uh being in line for there with all Japan was the junior belt. Um I had a really, really good pivotal match of my career at the Budokan with Danny Crawford. He was the uh, junior heavyweight champion and it was a title match. And besides that, it was the first time 
uh, for them to even give me the ball and let me run a few yards with it because they were very protective uh, when I was young and green. So I was always in six man tag matches um, where they could tag in and take over most of the match. And literally like Stan Hansen could just grab me and throw me out of the ring and just come in like a bully and, uh, and take over whether I tagged or not, you know, in the middle of my spot, whatever, he didn't give a fuck. And, um, at the Budokan, which was the big show every tour, um, th that was always the one we looked forward to. Last day of the tour, uh, payoff day, brand new 100 stacks of brand new $100 bills. Shh, don't know how that was. Like, he must have got straight from the government or something. But um, I always did wonder. But um, that was uh, my match. It was 95 or 96. 95, I think. Could have been 96. One of those it's years. It's available online. It's available online. Dad. Yeah, yeah. Danny Kraft. And, and I learned so much during that during that match. Uh, but the reason that I brought it up is that Sabu told me beforehand, he said, hey, don't don't beat him. Don't beat him. He said, you don't you don't want to be the uh, junior heavyweight champion because then you'll be you'll be labeled a junior for your whole career. And you'll never be able to shake it. And he said, "Junior, uh, juniors don't make top money. The main eventers are always the heavyweights." And he said, uh, "You know, you don't. They don't consider you a junior. Um, this this will change that, and that you'll be labeled for your whole career. So, you know, don't don't go for that." Wow. So, uh, how about that? That would have been that's something. So, did they offer you the opportunity to win that title, and were you like? Oh. Uh, it didn't. It, it wasn't articulated like that. But through my whole career, I was kind of like just above the line because they would say like two twenty five is the cutoff, you know. Yeah. And I was usually like just just above that, two thirty, two thirty five, and and um. So a lot of people uh, would think that I was a junior, but. I never was in the junior tournaments and the junior matches and stuff. Like whenever that came around and they were capitalizing on some of those guys, they would uh, they they would um, not try to pull me in. So I was thankful for it because of what Sabu said. You know, he's he was my teacher, whether it's true or not. Um, and now, I mean, the and I think it was true too. But not but now, I mean, it's changed so much that. Um, you know, being 230 pounds now, shit makes me the biggest guy in the dressing room. <laughs> and, and by the way, a lot of those uh, 225ers that were doing the junior or lightweight or cruiserweight um, stuff, they were 225 with rocks in their pockets. So yeah. have, have someone like 230 stand next to them, you might have been able to tell in, in some situations as well. You know, well, Rob, seeing you physically, like in person, you are definitely not a cruiserweight or a junior. <laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> but um, I think what's um, what else was I going to say? Well, it's kind of interesting because you look at like how the Intercontinental title was positioned. It's like, hey, that's like the, the workhorse title. And then that usually was the indicator that, hey, this is we have confidence in this person to eventually become the WWE champion. And so it's uh, it's kind of an yeah. interesting dynamic, but the fact that it's like junior on the end that's a that's a pretty cool insight by Sabu to kind of think about that too and like have that kind of information. So that's neat. Yeah, yeah. So um, that's there was that match. I also had a a match with Kikuchi when Kikuchi was the junior um, heavyweight champion. In fact, it was it was. It was that time probably when I wrestled Kikuchi. It was it was probably that match that Sabu told me, you know, don't go for that belt. Uh, and and um, matter of fact, I think it was. And then, uh, but but then I wrestled a uh, uh, Crawford uh, bef before that. Either way, um, I, I hadn't wrestled that many times for the uh, junior heavyweight championship belt in any company, um, and. When I did, um, I guess uh, I guess I ended up doing a job. <laughs> yeah, well, shucks. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wanted, wanted to real quick circle back with the Rock getting his trademark. When you jumped over to WWE, did they try to acquire your name, like the rights to your name, and not, nothing like that? Well, no, they didn't. Um, I had 
a manager, a Hollywood manager that I used as a buffer to, uh, to help me with my contract. And I ended up regretting it because of the commission that, that, that he would thereby make was, was not earned or even, uh, there wasn't even anything for him to do. And I was working so hard. I, you know, I couldn't stand like one, once a week, I'm going to a town just to pay him, you know, yeah. like flying somewhere, getting a car, hotel. I'm so burnt out. I'm, I need to, I need sleep. I'm stressed out. They're killing me. Politics. I couldn't, I, I was going crazy. And then, you know, to think that, that that was to, uh, to just because I thought, that having him was going to somehow be a benefit to me between to have a buffer between me and the office. There, there wasn't, he was back in his office at home in, in, in California um, or it is somewhere else in South Carolina. And anyway, I'm on the road with Jr. you know, and with uh, Bruce Pritchard and with uh, Vince and anybody um, that I was talking to, I'm seeing them face to face and, and so, you know, for me to go back home and then have him talk to them, it was like they didn't want to do it. And, and I ended up also uh, regretting doing it. But he had a long list of stuff that excluded me from uh, from their grabs, you know, on the intellectual properties, anything I was working on, any stories. And I have a whole bunch of random things that – still have never got finished that may never get finished and, and, and maybe they will, maybe they won't. And, and I don't care as much as I used to, but you know, I've, I've got scripts, uh, novels. Um, they, they, there's a list of things that, um, and it might've gone against me um, that I have so much stuff that, that, that says, you know, you, you, you can't own this cause RVD already owns it. And it, but among that, along that list, of course, was RVD, Rob Van Dam. When I left, eventually, um, there was a there was a paper that the legal gave me that, that that showed me the split of properties that they had acquired since I'd been there. And it was like uh, it was it was something as follows: like Mister Monday Night, I own; Mister Tuesday Night, they own. <laughs> Yeah, the whole effing show I own. The whole damn show they own. And wow. uh and, yeah, and it was like that. And they and they even sent me something when they were letting the patents run out worldwide. Or not the patents, I'm sorry, but the uh trademark. And and it would and, and so they were like, you know, you might want to grab them just for your own protection so other people don't grab them. Uh but they were like you had to get them in every different country and it was super expensive. And I was just like, well, I'm going to go with the good old fashioned, um, um, shit, what do you call it? Um, you, you, your common, common law fucking trademark. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. I'm Rob Van Dam. I've been Rob Van Dam for over 30 years. I can prove it. So. Well, that's interesting. Well, yeah. I never yeah. really put that piece that together. Yeah. The whole fucking show or the whole effing show. That's more you yeah. than the yeah. I remember seeing WWE shirts whole damn show. <laughs> it's interesting. Yeah, How about yeah that? which I like. I like that as as well. You know, I've been I like using uh, that sometimes, but um, it was split up like that. You know, and I was like, I, I hate Mister Tuesday anyway. Keep it. <laughs> Tuesday sucks. <laughs> Whoever said that? That didn't catch on. <laughs> no, uh-uh. But the names of my moves, everything, yeah, it's all broke down. But so there was never any worries of that going in uh, because I was that uh, my identity uh, was consistent with my intellectual property. And they never tried to say like, "Hey, do you think it would change your name going in?" Never. No, that's why I didn't want to go to WWE in two thousand one. I was afraid that they would give me some lame character and uh, change everything about me. And that really bothered me because I really, I mean, obviously it's always been important for me to be myself. And, and I really thought that that was going to be up, up for a battle. You know, I thought they were going to just come up with some lame, who knows what. That's why I was even upset. Um, I didn't tell them 
that I kissed Ted DiBiase's foot because I didn't want them to make an angle out of it. That that was oh. that was what I dedicated my life to to become a wrestler to to get revenge on him. I I, I could just see them doing something like that, so um, I didn't want them to know you know anything like that. Uh, my dad told them when they were doing that behind the, that um, before they were superstars show that ended up also being on the one of a kind dvd but i was like dad yeah, oh, no. they're gonna make me look so stupid <laughs> but no they didn't though they they respected what i had going i guess or yeah. i don't think they ever even though i don't think they ever understood me i think i think everyone can agree that wwe never really understood me or why the crowd reacted the way they did to me do you think it was a mentality too, or is like there's that that aspect where they always just said like, well, if Vince McMahon didn't create you, then like that was always a slight against you because like the the thing was like when Taz came to WWE and he got that huge pop at Royal Rumble 2000 and stuff like that, they said like that killed him in like a lot of the ways because like it was that was Taz, it was ECW Taz showing up and not something that right. was the creation of WWE. So. I think they gave Taz another Z. They did. They put another Z on it. <laughs> I think that, yes, that, that has been a factor. Yeah, because uh, – and, and not only because of it being true in fact, they didn't create me. I, I'm someone else that came in. But also because I lived it too much. Like I – too much for them, meaning I was too protective uh, of – for them, I think um, – of everything stupid they wanted me to say or do. And, and I always just felt like I know RVD way better than you know RVD. You guys don't even understand me. Paul did. And Paul, I feel like Paul was always trying to explain me to the office and that certain guys in the office um, that might have power now would have rather just passed on me. You know, I'm like, well, I, I think let's look somewhere else, you know, uh, and and that's the impression that I that I always got, and that others were like they didn't understand, you know, like is it because he's because uh, he's because he's handsome? We got to do something some kind of romantic, you know, lover boy kind of, you know, is it you know because he's a surfer, dude? That's why that's why people love him, you know. Uh, is it you know what what is it that? And so I, I always felt like that, and um, you know, I think that. If they created my character and were able to explain it to me, that they would have been a lot happier than me trying to uh, – and them trying to fit pieces together when sometimes it didn't feel like a good fit. Right, right. And it's like the way you connected with people is that you were who you are. Like if they – tried to put a hat on you and be like, Hey, look at uh, Matt Byrne is back in WWE. <laughs> right. It's like, uh, that's not who Rob Van Dam is. And you wouldn't have made that strong of a connection with the fans if they tried to change you. So it's like, you did, you, yeah. gotta, you know, you're your own entity, man. It's, so it's a really, it's a really weird business where, you know, I was talking about how competitive it is and how, um, you know, everybody wants to. Everybody wants to win. Everybody wants to be top guy. Everybody wants to make more money. It's your job. Who in their job doesn't want to make more money? And usually, that requires some kind of a uh, uh, ascension or escalation in your in your in your position. And then that's you know, with with wrestling, it's 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 really no different, except for it's way the fuck different because it's also a balance of locker room mentality. You know, which says if you're talking to the office, you're a stooge. And it's like there's 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 such conflicting opposite perspectives looking at the exact same scenario in the world of pro wrestling. So um, having been brought up by the hoods when I was really young, um, you know, they hated the office and anyone was a stooge that hung out with the office. Gary Albright hated anybody that would hang out with Johnny Ace because he hated Johnny Ace. <laughs> Gary knew. Gary knew about Johnny. <laughs> um, <laughs> but he hated him. And that was his 
reason for breathing on the all japan bus was just to go oh, I hate Johnny. He's, I fucking hate him he was like he was, and and you know we would get heat any of us for even talking to johnny that made us stooges and and he, and and that's the locker room mentality and that is still part of what we have now in this safe for work politically correct work environment it's a combination it's a hybrid it's like it used to be all that pretty much and, and now it's not but that's still there that's still that element is still there and maybe mostly probably with guys my age guys a little bit older a little bit younger but a, a, as the younger and younger guys keep coming up and changing uh what what wrestling is what it's about um then that's that's going to uh that's going to change as well uh, i forgot what i was i forgot what i was going to say now i just got i started thinking about the uh how, about how the young guys when they bring you know now like their whole agenda is different. It used to be about, we got this good thing. We're gypsies. We travel around, you know, let's stick together. Let's protect our thing. You know, get away from us. Don't, don't look at our, don't look in our bag. Don't look, you know, and, and, and now it's more about, you know, I want to show everybody what I can do if I set it up. Yeah. You know, who cares? They know it's set up. They know it's set up anyway. So who cares uh, that I'm taking three minutes to, you know, to climb up and leaving the guy down there long enough to take a eight hour sleep and hit deep realm. <laughs> you know? um, but anyway, I got distracted from, uh, from what I was thinking about, but guys, uh, um, uh, Oh, I know what it was. So, um, if you look at it like it's a, well, you know, I don't want to, this is how Kevin Nash put it, right? He said, it's a business. But as soon as you start treating it, treating it like it's a business, then you're an asshole. And, and something like that. I might be. Well, he's, that's what, yeah, I think that you hit it pretty much. <laughs> yeah. And, and I like it when he said that because what he's saying is what I'm saying. Like uh, a lot of people that they get ahead um, are guys that, hoods would disapprove of but so what hoods must feel just entitled just to have their job and just expect everyone to come up with programs for them and ideas for them to keep them relevant keep them in their position compelling to the boss to the show and, and really if you got ideas and stuff that's great you know and that's how you get ahead it just it wasn't allowed you know from uh from that stupid meathead locker room uh perspective that that i was brought up in it wasn't uh so anyway johnny ace w represented that you know he was office that's why him and vince are so close you know and uh, him and miss baba were really close and uh um he didn't care but he had different values than the other boys and uh he wanted to be office you know, even though he was wrestling and he ended up in a pretty high position in the industry in the end. But man, Gary used to, uh, whew, we get so hot, so hot over, over nothing. Over just, just Johnny being Johnny. <laughs> just Johnny being Johnny. That's it. Unless there was some, some, something behind it that I never really knew, but he just, you know, thought that Johnny was political and two faced and shallow and, in genuine uh, because his values were getting himself ahead with the office, uh, not having the boys back so much, you know, and it's like, Hey, it made sense at the time, but you know, look, where's, where's he and where's he. And I'm not saying that Johnny's in a good spot now after this news broke out. Uh, but look, but he did, did look, he did reach a pretty, uh, substantial um status in the industry and now you know maybe you know he's, he's maybe he's in hot water but gary's dead yeah that's true gary how old was gary was he like 35 or 36 or something um I should look yeah i guess i guess he i'm not sure yeah i don't i guess he would have been 38 at the most he was older than me 63 he was born in 63 died in 2000 so that would make him what 37 yeah 37 about 
No, yeah, 37-36. Ooh, crazy, crazy. Young dude, young dude to die. Very much so. He was he was diabetic. Oh, really? That boy used to always say, man, Gary does not take care of himself for being diabetic because he drinks, you know, takes pills, fucking party, 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 stays up all night. The heaviest of the partiers, you know, really, um, physically. <laughs> and, and, you know, it wasn't, there was, there was no like, oh, I'm just going to get eight hours sleep tonight, guys. But not, not that I saw anyway. And, man, one time. One time, um, we were in uh, at the uh, I think it was at the Ginza Tokyo Hotel, um, and whew, for some, me and Bobby Duncan Jr. For some reason, we were inside Gary's room, and Gary was having a diabetic uh, sugar dropping attack. Oh. And he was like, you know, he was sweating and then he was becoming uh, despondent. He was not answering our questions, you know, and all of a sudden he just, he became non-responsive. And, uh, and he just like, uh, boom, just like laid, bam, he took a bump face down on the, on the bed mattress. And Bobby Duncan Jr. is like, Rob, we got to give him a shot, man. Where's the stuff? And I'm like, whoa. <laughs> Bobby, are you, do you, are you sure we have to give him a shot? What if he's got too much insulin? I, I, I do you know? I don't, I know nothing about this, man. Fuck that. And Bobby's like, uh, nah, we got to try, man. Come on. And Bobby grabbed a fucking syringe and he had it and he fucking uh, pulls uh, uh, Gary's cheek out. And I'm like, Bobby, Bobby, what if you fucking kill him? Like, what if, what if that's not what he needs? And he's like, Gary, Gary, I'm gonna give you a shot. Is that all right? Gary, you need a shot? Come on, Rob. He's not in. Holy fuck, dude. I'm the only one alive that knows this story out of everyone wow. I'm telling you. Yeah. So, okay. Del Wilkes comes in. He opens up the door. Um, I guess it was unlocked or whatever. And he starts like come walking in and he looks over and sees Gary face down on the bed with his ass hanging out, and Bobby with a syringe in his hand, about to jab him in the ass. And and Del just said, uh he was the Patriot, for anyone that's yeah, yeah. Uh, he, did, he was eating some chips or something. He was like, oh, my God. I didn't, I didn't see anything. He turned around and just walked right the fuck out. <laughs> yeah, that was the uh, – that was – fuck, man. Glad I could share that story with everybody, Van Damme fam, because uh, Bobby is not going to share that story, and neither is Gary, and neither is Del. Wow. Yeah, that's wild, dude. That's wild. Yeah. So wait, so did Bobby give him the shot then? Give him the what? shot. And uh and then and then he came around. Wow, how about that? <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> I know that's gotta be nerve-wracking because it's like what do you, I'm not familiar. I mean, like I knew kids in school that had diabetic and had to take insulin, but when do you do it? When do you not do it? Right. And now now, you know, I I I know a lot more than I did then about insulin and your blood sugar, and maybe I could figure something out. I don't I don't know, but that I was my I had never even thought about learning anything about it at that time. And um, I was just thinking like, dude, he's going to have a heart attack because his insulin is too high and you're giving him more insulin. And, uh, but that actually is something else. Um, um, but some people do that though. They get too much insulin. And then I think there's a backup of it because there's no sugar to keep the insulin busy to, to, and, and uh, it doesn't, it's not absorbed where it needs to be. So there's like a, but anyway, um, hey, um, they're gone, and uh, John Laurinaitis is uh, still around. You might hear his name come up um, in the near future. Yeah, oh boy. Johnny Ace, baby. Quite dynamic dude. Um, all right, so uh, let's see. Jeb, I forgot to give this super chat. Jem the Dawn, thank you for the $5. He said, you can be in any type of movie, Rob. What would it be? Lighting one. Porno, me and ten gorgeous bitches all lined up. Oh, no. Okay, porn. <laughs> what would the Rob Van Dam porn name? The name of the movie. Be? What would it be? Um, I'm trying to think of a good one. Uh, I mean, you know, in order to do that, then I'd have to have a lot of conditions. You know, like nobody could see it. 
Mm-hmm. Your mom would have to probably not be around. <laughs> you that kind of thing. I'm not saying I don't have any um, on VHS around the house like that. I'm just saying. No. Um, hold on. I'm not, I'm not sure if I want to stick to that answer or should I think about it um, in a serious manner as if what I care. Um, yeah, you know what? I guess really I think it would be cool to do a comedy action. Dry comedy, Leslie Nielsen, police squad type of shit, naked gun type of comedy with an action movie. Maybe They Call Me Bruce was, I believe, was kind of like one of those, but I would have a lot of fun with something like that. And so um, on a serious note, that would be my choice and my showcasing. So you the action, yeah. so try and make you laugh. That'd be great. If you had to do a buddy cop film, who would be your partner? Actor, could be an actor or a wrestler. Who would you want as your buddy cop film partner? This was pitched. This was pitched a while ago. Um, Sonny Ono was trying to get his guy, and uh, maybe he was doing some acting, he was getting into some acting or whatever, but they had a, uh, a buddy cop, buddy, buddy. Uh, script for a was it a movie or a TV series? I can't remember, but I was in it. It was going to be me and um, uh, Dragon Dragon Face. Who's the guy? Um, the wrestler. He's like my age. He hangs out with Sonny Ono. Sonny Ono manages him in real life. Uh, Dragon. Yes, thank you. Yeah. yeah. I- I was blanking on his name, damn it. Um, so yeah, anyway, that would uh, that was pitched uh, for a while that we was gonna. Uh, I, I'm all there's like over the years, there's so many projects that are mentioned and then go nowhere or go somewhere, but not all the way. And that's why I have like different scripts and novels and stories, stuff that I've written half of or quarter of. Or even like 90% of, and then it's like, I don't know if I'll get back to it or not. You know, I hope so, because I know it's a great idea. People would love it. And I feel that way about several of uh, my projects. And then uh, the Universal, bring them around. When I rented an office on Hollywood Boulevard just to get this idea out of my head um, that was uh, for a a movie. And it was... and it was something that it was so long ago that now there's other things that are kind of similar to it that I see where I'm like, ah, it wouldn't seem as original, but it would still be very cool. And, and hey, I'm not even talking to you. Siri is fucking recording me right oh, now. Come on. Bitch. Um, you can't stop it. <laughs> I ran it just, and I never quite finished it, but I got like uh, to like, the, the 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 end like everything's coming together at the end and now i haven't touched it in at least 10 years and it's something that like it used to bother me like oh i gotta do it i gotta get on it you know and and it's the same thing like with my autobiography you know like i might tell a few stories jot, jot them down record them whatever and then man a year might go by and it's like it's not that i don't want to do it um but obviously it's not number one on my priority or else I would do it. That's that's how I cope with me not getting stuff done. But let's, uh, let's come back to that for RVD, for two, two minutes uh, of RVDology at the end. All right. Well, yeah, are you ready? We can do it now. Sure. I'm just talking about right here. Like, uh, I know that uh, people want to rush things. And it's easy to want to do because uh, you want it and you want it now and you need it now. And I've been in that position so many times that I recognize it and I try to avoid it now. And so that's become one of my main values that I share with people a lot is like, you can't rush it, dude, because there there's so many things like uh, where some maybe someone is unemployed, uh, but they're waiting to hear back on this one thing or, the, or, or, 
or they're selling something on eBay and they're they're just waiting and they need it. and they're like, man, if that could only happen by Sunday, then I'd, then I'd be able to have the money to buy the tickets on Monday and bam, bam, and, and and they want should I call them again? You know, should I find out? Like I don't know what. It's a it's a bad place to be in because you're not vibing uh, a good positive vibration. It's more of a desperate vibe. And I hate whenever I'm there because people that have seen me with the desperate vibe, they seem to remember that a lot longer than I would like them to to remember it. You know, so now uh, I even if I really feel like, man, you know what, uh, I, this has to fall into place in the next two weeks. Otherwise, I'm not going to be able to do it because I got these other commitments, obligations, it's going to, it's going to clash. Uh, damn, I need it to happen. Uh, whenever I feel like something like that, instead, I'm like, you know what? As long as I'm doing everything that I can to make what I want happen, that's all I can do. Can't do anything else. So there's no need to worry about it. All I can do is hope, which is a positive vibration. Hope that everything works out. Um, and a lot of stuff, uh, it ends up working out at a different time that ends up being beneficial anyway. And then after I see the bigger picture, I'm like, man, I was wanting this to happen way back then. But if it would have, I wouldn't have met so-and-so in the meantime. I wouldn't even be able to share this with them. And it's, it, it's, it's a faith. It's a trust in life, in the universe, that things do work out when they're supposed to. And so... Um, Living by the seat of my pants as I do, uh, going going with the flow of Zen and just trusting what I said is is how I live. So if you got something that you're you you feel like you're really putting a lot of pressure, even though you've already done everything you can, stop with the pressure, take the pressure off. It's gonna happen. Uh, it's gonna happen when it's gonna happen. And uh, so. A lot of people are going to be able to use that. I just know it. I feel it out there. A lot of people can relate to that. And it's true. That's one of the ways of life. You, you, you can't make things happen when you want them to happen, no matter how bad it seems like you need that to happen. Doesn't mean it's never going to happen, but maybe it never will. Either way, do what you can. Line up all the factors in your favor and then hope and good luck with that and so uh uh i hope to see y'all next week van dam fam excellent one man yeah that's something i factor in all the time yeah, yes sir. very good it's it comes in because like yeah you sometimes you put so much pressure on yourself you're like i gotta get this done or i want this done and this needs to be completed what can i do to make this happen and sometimes you just gotta let the universe paint it all out so. yeah in the way that i uh deal with my own um order of accomplishments if it's conflicting with how i would like them to be i look at my priorities you know like i would love to do this my autobiography before someone else writes it it is very important to me but is it more important than watching tv i guess not or else i would do it yeah. <laughs> instead of watching tv you know, um, and and that's just being real with myself. I would like to apply some discipline so that I work on it even when I would rather sometimes do something else. That's kind of what discipline is. But in the end, I got to rather want to do that, really, in order to, to do it. Yeah. It's yeah, it's just we always have the conflicting feelings in our head. Sometimes we only identify with with one of those feelings and not the exact opposite, but it's usually there. And so looking around in it, for most of the things, I figure um, I must do them in the order that they're the most important to my whole being, to me, to my mind, my agenda. Otherwise, I would probably do something in a different order. And uh, so... Keep that one. Keep that as a as a as a tool in your back pocket too. If you're questioning, you know, like, oh, why can't I apply my apply myself and, and and do my homework at night? You probably really don't want to. It probably sucks. It's not your favorite experience of the whole day. So it's something that 
yeah, a lot of us would want to avoid. We avoid things that are displeasurable and kind of instead aim for the things that we enjoy. Imagine that. Wow, could you could you fathom that? Yeah. See, I can't wait to do my taxes. <laughs> sometimes, so sometimes though priorities change because of outside factors, like uh, time, for instance. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, like boom, what? I gotta have this done tomorrow. Guess what? Thing. Now it just became way more important to me. So now instead of watching TV, I am going to work on it. Things like that happen. Um, and, and so you can try to change your priorities, but really your priorities are based on the level of importance to you based on your values. So I'm not sure you can really change that so much as identify with it and use that is framework to, 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 to work within, you know, so you can be real to yourself, true to yourself. And, um, you know, maybe, uh, maybe some of your values, you might look at them and say, wow, I didn't know. Uh, I thought th that I felt more like this, but I guess I really don't. I feel more like this, you know, that happens all the time. Yeah. Yeah. That's some next level shit right there, Rob. <laughs> RBD ology. Boom. Four for. Hell yeah. Yeah. Guys, if you like what you're seeing, you can catch it early on the Premier Streaming Network. Uh, the episodes drop. Uh, also, you can go to rvdpod.com, which is right up above me there, and you can subscribe and see some clips and uh, episodes on there. But we also uh, have the debut of rvdtv.com, where you get the episodes every Monday at 4.20 p.m., and then you get clips on there, too, exclusive clips and stuff like that. So be sure to subscribe to both, like and share and comment. And, uh, yeah, we have a pretty good time. Rob, it's great. By the, way, by the way, we have all the old RVD TV episodes. I don't know about all of them, but a bunch of them. And as we talked about earlier, the RVD radio from Blog Talk Radio, we have those episodes up at the YouTube page that's um, the real RVD. So hopefully yeah. hopefully, yeah. YouTube Chris will put a, uh, a, bu a bump, uh, end card right Ooh. there at RVD radio so you can just yeah. click it. I didn't know there were already radio episodes were up on there. Yeah, yep. Yes, sir. Uh, I, um, man, when did we do that? 2008? It was a long time. It was like 2011 or 10 or – it was a nine, maybe 2009, I think it was, Rob. I, I used to wait years. like five minutes before the – and I'd say, shit, let me – I didn't get no guests on here. You know, let me let me call Booker. Let me call Jingles. Let me see if they can be on it real quick, you know. And and it was, I, I never liked planning and uh, – well, I still don't, you know, but – um, but I had a lot of a lot of fun with it, and obviously, I like to share insight with those who are interested in uh, in hearing it. So Thanks. that's you know, without without the platform, I'm not going to be as talkative. But something like this, or where you've come to see me or hear me talk, you know, then uh, then you get me opening up. But mostly, I'm comfortable uh, letting someone else do the talking. There you go. That's the way to handle it, Rob. Well, cool, guys. Thank you for joining us, our live uh, tune-inners. And then th thank you if you guys uh, check, if you happen to watch on YouTube later on or you check it on the audio uh, via Apple iTunes or uh, what you would call it, Spotify. Please give us some ratings. That really helps so much. And we appreciate everybody tuning in. Rob, thanks so much. The RVDology is awesome. Uh, really good episodes. Sweet. Yep. Uh, I think my next um, advertised appearance is uh, – February 10th or 11th. I think it's the 10th in uh, Queens, New York at WrestleZone. So we're going to, we'll do, I think one more show before that. And then I'll, oh, start, yeah. then I'll start plugging uh, what uh, comes forward from there. And who knows? Maybe I'll find something to do to give us something to talk about in the meantime. I like that. I like the sound of that, Rob. Hey guys, we will see you next week here on one of a kind with RVD baby.